In the 1980s, contaminated blood products infected more than 1,000 Canadians with HIV. Many of those infected have died from AIDS since then. Tonight, new evidence to suggest that some of their deaths could have been prevented. In this documentary report, Leslie McKinnon examines the blood file. These are the faces of Canada's hemophiliacs who have died of AIDS. Out of about 2,500 hemophiliacs in this country, over 700 have been touched by the deadliest disease of this century. The saddest moment? <clears throat> Having to stand over um, a bed and watch a, a fellow hemophiliac die, watching his, his kids his wife, knowing that the wife is infected because she was never told that it could be passed on sexually from the hemophiliac, having to sit there and embrace somebody after they've just buried their husband or their son, which one do you want? Which one is the saddest moment? They're all sad. Who is accountable? It's the question hemophiliacs would like to see answered. Hemophiliacs' lives depend on blood products, and when AIDS infiltrated the blood supply, they were among the most vulnerable. All the custodians of their health, the Red Cross, the government, their own medical advisors, had occasion to act to save them, but didn't. Government indifference, vested interests, missed opportunities. They all contributed to the public health scandal that will result in the deaths of a third of all hemophiliacs in Canada. I fought a, a long, hard struggle. I couldn't do it again. Uh, that's it for me. When Randy Connors was born, children with hemophilia lived on average to about age 11. Modern medicine changed all that, for a while, until AIDS. He and his wife, Janet, are in their mid-30s, but he probably won't make 40, and he's back in hospital, where he spent so much time growing up. His childhood was split, half at home, half in hospital, for transfusions, because his blood couldn't clot on its own. He was tied to the hospital. Even so, before he was a teenager, bleeding in his joints had caused some crippling, Sports and camping were out of the question. And then came a miracle drug called Factor VIII Concentrate, portable and convenient. It had the ability to build up clotting strength, not just to stop bleeding, but to prevent it. Randy Connors, a severe hemophiliac, by the mid-80s was in far more danger from the concentrate he was taking than he ever was from bleeding to death. That's because Factor VIII concentrate was condensed from the pooled plasma donations of thousands of people. One donation contaminated with HIV could infect the entire lot. David Page of the Canadian Hemophilia Society, himself a hemophiliac, says it's a cruel irony that these new blood products were supposed to prolong hemophiliacs' lives. That was especially difficult for people to accept that. Uh, the same product that offered this freedom and, and uh, a wonderful life would be the one that would eventually kill them. If there ever was a critical point for saving Canada's hemophiliacs, perhaps as many as half of them, it was the start of 1983. For them, it was the beginning of the epidemic. In January of that year, in Atlanta, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, an organization whose job it is to protect the uninfected from contagious disease, called a meeting to sound an alarm. It's a meeting that's become historic in its importance. Scientists from all over North America gathered to hear the message that this deadly disease that was killing gay men had invaded the blood system. Recommendations that came out of this meeting were widely discussed by the blood industry, including Canadian health officials. 
But in the end, hardly anyone heeded the warning. Dr. Don Francis was a key speaker, and he says he became incensed at the apathy. I was pounding on the table and yelling, uh, you know, how many cases, how many deaths do you need before you'll act? Don Francis recommended that all hemophiliacs switch to safer products immediately. For the most part, his advice was ignored. There was this amazing denial at this period of time, at a time when we know in retrospect that you could have saved the majority of these individuals who are now infected uh, if a, uh, um, maybe less convenient but not terribly radical change was made in their treatment. The replacement treatment he advocated was an old one, called cryoprecipitate. It had to be kept frozen until it was used, and it couldn't be packed in a suitcase. It wasn't as effective as factor VIII concentrate, but it had a great advantage. It was made from the blood of just a few donors instead of thousands. The chances it carried HIV were far less. But the order for all hemophiliacs to switch never came. Health and Welfare, who had the regulatory authority to order the change, didn't. The Red Cross, which could have recommended a switch, didn't. Even the newsletters of the Hemophilia Society over the next year downplayed the risk with warnings like these. The risk of not treating bleeding episodes is far greater than the risk of getting AIDS from factor products used to treat these episodes. Somebody should have been pushing the panic buttons. Somebody should have been saying, we have a problem here. They knew about the problem in 1982. Nothing was done. And my question is, why was there nothing done about it? Santo Kaira is a hemophiliac working with the Ontario Hemophilia Society. The issue of the medical advisor's failure to advise all hemophiliacs to switch to safer treatment has created a rift between some hemophiliacs and the National Hemophilia Organization. They chose not to broadcast that particular problem to the severity and to the weight that it deserved. They chose to downplay it. And that's something that each and every one of those medical practitioners will probably have to live with for the rest of their lives. But at least they have the luxury of doing that. David Page of the Canadian That's Hemophilia really Society says their newsletters could only repeat the information given to them by their medical advisors. The information was wrong. The recommendations were, were, were not wise. Uh, however, those were the recommendations that were given to us by the medical experts. And it was our job to, uh, to uh, disseminate them, and that's what we did. Like most hemophiliacs, Randy Connors would have had to think hard about switching back to cryoprecipitate. It was safer, but it could possibly have caused more debilitating joint bleeding. But he was never given the choice. Randy loves life. And uh, given an option of, of having to spend the rest of his life disabled in a wheelchair or dead before he was 40, I, I really suspect he would have chosen, you know, I'll take the chance and end up in the wheelchair because at least he would be alive. By 1984, it seemed as if the Canadian government was finally ready to act. It was now known that heat treating the factor eight and nine blood products hemophiliacs used killed the viruses. So the government ordered the Red Cross to make the switch to heat treated products as soon as possible. The Red Cross's response was to call for a conference to set a timetable for the change as soon as possible turned out to be six months. Everyone, including the government and the Hemophilia Society's own medical advisors, agreed to the delay. In the meantime, most hemophiliacs would have to take products that now health officials privately conceded were tainted. There were rooms full of chamberlains when we needed a Churchill, and we didn't have one. Bill Mendel of the Ontario Hemophilia Society monitored the conference. Nobody questioned, he says, that it would take six months to get the new heat-treated products. I don't know if anybody said, but why can't we buy this immediately at four times the price? Um, if there was a discussion about that. Um, people were very, very polite in those days. There was lots of not, let's not rock the boat kind of promotion on all this. Um, uh, I can't explain why they didn't do something else.
you know, the, the assumption is that there was delays here in Canada as opposed to other places in the world. That's not the case. Steve Vick of the Red Cross insists that back then there was a worldwide shortage of heat-treated product, and the Red Cross just couldn't get enough right away. We went out to the manufacturers in the United States and said, this is how much we require. We need it as soon as possible. How much can you give us and when and what guarantees can you give? We couldn't get contractual guarantees on delivery. New evidence now shows that at the time the Red Cross claims they couldn't obtain heat-treated product, many American companies were selling it. So I, I don't think there was any problem with Alpha supplying the uh, Canadian market with heat-treated material in, uh, from January on in 1985. Pardon? Thomas Drees is the former president of Alpha Therapeutics, an American manufacturer of heat-treated Factor 8 product. He's now a consultant in the blood business. There perhaps was considered to be not enough because uh, there was not enough at the old low price of roughly 10 to 12 cents a, a unit. But because of the uh, yield factor or the loss of material through heat treating, the prices had to be increased to uh, 16 to 18 cents a unit, and uh, I, as far as I'm concerned and my knowledge of the industry at that time, there was plenty of material available at the higher and indeed fairer price. The money had been approved. There was, it, this wasn't an issue of dollars and cents. This was an issue of availability. I mean, there was no reason for anybody to delay the impl implementation of heat-treated factor eight, just as there was no reason in other countries around the world. Everybody was scrambling. When asked, the Red Cross says they cannot provide documentation about this shortage. The, the, the real ultimate point is, uh, are you placing an order? If you're placing an order, then we would have been able to take care of it. We and the others, not just uh, Alpha. Andres is backed up by the Market Research Bureau in California, a company that has tracked the availability of products like Factor 8. Their president says, quote, I'm not aware of any shortage. Not only was there product available for the U.S. market, but there was product left over for export. In his darkest moments, Santo Kyra can only speculate about why the Red Cross's switch over to heat-treated products took so long. Which then leads someone to think, are they doing this in order to use up the existing stocks of non-heat-treated blood products? And then you bring in the heat-treated blood products because, of course, hey, you can't just throw the stuff away. You might as well let the hemophilix use it. They're all infected anyway. The Canadian Hemophilia Society is still trying to explain why their own medical advisors unquestioningly agreed to a six-month delay for safe heat-treated products. Their defense is that health and welfare is responsible for the blood system and was asleep at the wheel. The Health and Welfare Canada Bureau of Biologics abdicated their responsibility to monitor that system. They accepted the, the, the expertise of the, of, of the Canadian Red Cross. Uh, at no point did, the, did, the, did Health and Welfare say, uh, we, we will uh, uh, withdraw those products. Indeed, the Department of Health and Welfare's own regulations give it not just the power, but also the responsibility to recall unsafe products. The Food and Drug Act prohibits the distribution of drugs, including blood products, that are unsafe for use. But no recall order was ever issued. I guess I was appalled at how little responsibility anybody took in, in really managing this. And I remember at the time, in probably 1985, somewhere subsequent to the conference, that. Uh, a couple of fishery inspectors um, uh, opened a can of tuna fish and it smelled bad in the factory. And uh, a federal minister lost his job over that. And, uh, and a, a, a tuna fish plant was shut down in a town in New Brunswick. And I thought, how could they take such an action on a small product and ignore what was going on in blood products at the time or not take any action? Not only were hemophiliacs not being given the choice of a safer product, they weren't being warned about the risk they were taking. They weren't being told that for the few who weren't already infected, taking factor eight concentrate was a lot like playing Russian roulette. 
And they weren't being told that if there was a good chance they already had the virus, then there was a good chance they could pass it on to someone else. Every option of denial was taken. First option was there was no, there was little risk of, of getting infected from factor eight. Flew in the face of all the data that was available, but, let, but let's choose denial instead of action. The second was, oh yes, they do get infected, but they're not going to progress like gay men. No evidence whatsoever that it made any difference how you got the virus in terms of your progression. And then finally was, well, yes, they are infected, they are going to get AIDS, but they're not going to transmit to their spouses, and so no need for, uh, for condoms or safe sex was necessary. Certainly, no one warned Randy Connors. He was already HIV positive when he met Janet. They were both advised to practice safe sex, but only if they wanted to. As it happens, they did. But three years after they were married, Janet tested positive oh, yes. for HIV. Looking back, Janet Connors can't believe she wasn't warned more strongly about the dangers of transmission of AIDS from hemophiliacs to their partners. About six months before I tested positive, um, I was talking to a doctor and saying, you know, it seems like a fair number of condoms break. And I thought it was about 10%. And they said, uh, oh, don't worry about it, Janet. You know, after all this time, 10% of the condoms break, and you're sleeping with someone, and you're having sex with someone that's infected, don't worry, you're probably immune. And less than six months later, my next test came back positive. So I think you have, you have a population that, in a sense, was allowed to become infected. And nobody is taking responsibility for a thousand Canadians being infected with HIV through the use of Canadian source and international source blood products. And everybody's flying the coop. Everybody's going, it's not my fault. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Yeah. Well, there's a thousand people infected. Somebody's got to take the fall for this. In the blood debacle, all the players tend to blame each other. Or they argue that they were in a state of scientific uncertainty about AIDS. While they waited for proof, they chose to err on the side of doubt rather than on the side of caution. Hundreds of hemophiliacs are now paying with their lives for those decisions. To look back in hindsight 10 years later and say, well, maybe they could have done this or maybe they could have done that. Yes, maybe they could have. But at the time, people were trying to do their best. There was no reason for anybody not to. By January of 1983, everyone knew it was a risk and there was major, there should have been major adjustments at that point. It just kind of plateaued and everyone kind of accepted it as a risk. And then by the time it was all over, saying, oh yeah, there was nothing we could have done about it. The data are very clear that, that we could have done something about it at that time. Two weeks ago, Randy Connors nearly died from AIDS-related pneumonia. His wife, Janet, never left his side. He wants to live long enough to find out why hemophiliacs were let down by a public health system that was supposed to protect them. Who done it?